Hey there, I'm Carrie, and in this video, I'm going to be talking about Composed Upon Westminster Bridge, a poem by William Wordsworth published in 1807. We're going to read through the poem up front, then we'll go back and talk about a little bit of the history behind this era, and then take it line by line and take a closer look at the language. I've got timestamps in the video notes, so definitely scroll down, click around, find exactly what it is you need. And this poem is by request, so thank you very much to the person who suggested it. And without further ado, let's get into Composed Upon Westminster Bridge. Earth has not anything to show more fair. Dull would he be of soul who could pass by a sight so touching in its majesty. This city now doth like a garment wear the beauty of the morning, silent, bare. Ships, towers, domes, theaters, and temples lie open unto the fields and to the sky, all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. Never did sun more beautifully steep in his first splendor, valley, rock, or hill. Ne'er saw I, never felt a calm so deep. The river glideth at his own sweet will. Dear God, the very houses seem asleep, and all that mighty heart is lying still. All right, so let's go back and take a closer look. This is a sonnet, so it's only 14 lines, a very short poem, and the full title of this is actually Composed Upon Westminster Bridge, September 3rd, 1802. Now, William Wordsworth had a sister, Dorothy Wordsworth. They were very, very close and she frequently traveled with him. Now, she was not famous in her day and age, but Dorothy Wordsworth was actually a very accomplished writer herself and she kept detailed diary entries. Westminster Bridge is a site in central London over the River Thames and we know from Dorothy Wordsworth's journal that they actually crossed it on July 31st. And I wanna take a look at her journal entry because it gives us a much better idea uh, exactly of what they would have been looking at and uh, what time of the day and of the year it was. So let's take a look at that. We left London on Saturday morning at half past five or six, the 31st of July. We mounted the Dover coach at Charing Cross. It was a beautiful morning. The city, St. Paul's, with the river and a multitude of little boats, made a beautiful sight as we crossed Westminster Bridge. The houses were not overhung by their cloud of smoke, and they were spread out endlessly. Yet the sun shone so brightly, with such a fierce light, that there was even something like the purity of one of nature's own grand spectacles. So my first response reading Dorothy's journal entry is clearly William was copying his sister's homework. Um, she is a very eloquent writer, a very graceful writer, um, but you can tell not only did he benefit from her observations, benefited from her own skill as a writer. So it's really nice that we have this, but it's also great because we know exactly what Dorothy was looking at when she was inspired to write this down. Uh, so she mentions that she sees St. Paul's. That means that as they cross over Westminster Bridge, she is looking towards the north bank of the River Thames because that is where St. Paul's Cathedral is situated. It's that big, it's a very historic, uh, very historic site, but it's that great big domed church that you see over London. So in that sentence where she says the city, St. Paul's with the river, uh, the city, she probably means the London metropolis, but she could also mean like the actual city of London, the historic city of London. That is still um, a legal neighborhood, a legal zone that is within the London metropolis. There are a lot of historic sites there like St. Paul's Cathedral, uh, but also a lot of business goes on there, a lot of banking, a lot of government work. So it is very much uh, still a part of the city, still a part of British life. So in addition to St. Paul's Cathedral, she also would have been able to see Westminster Abbey, the historic Gothic cathedral that's about a thousand years old at this point. Also the Palace of Westminster, which is the Houses of Parliament. Uh, in addition to all the homes and businesses and the boats down on the river that she would have seen, I'm guessing she was probably looking at some smaller fishing vessels as well as maybe some larger merchant vessels, but it would have been quite a sight. Even in modern London, it is quite a sight. You can Google it, the view from Westminster Bridge towards the North Bank and see some of the things that Dorothy is referencing here. The other reason that I appreciate her journal entry is because she details exactly when it happened, um, which helps me a lot with the main problem that I have with this sonnet, which is in line eight. Uh, line eight says, all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. Smokeless air. That is 
completely unrealistic. Um, by 1802, the Industrial Revolution was already well underway. And in Great Britain, the Industrial Revolution was powered by coal. Everything ran on coal. And when you burn coal, it creates a thick, heavy smoke. Now, I will say the factory system was not like in full swing at this point. The big, you know, smokestacks, giant coal burning factories were not on the scene in London in 1802. But in the decades following this poem, uh, they popped up everywhere and air quality got so bad that London is still nicknamed the big smoke or old smoke. Back to 1802. Uh, the factories may not have been there yet, but Britain had already been burning coal for centuries at this point, you know, uh, in people's houses, you know, to keep warm, cook fires, washing fires, fires within businesses, this all would have run on coal. So even at this point, saying that there's smokeless air is very unrealistic. That is why I appreciate so much that Dorothy wrote down for us. This was the 31st of July. It was summertime. Uh, it was, you know, England's never all that warm, but it was the warmest it was going to get. So families would not have felt the need to take the risk of burning a fire at night. They would not have had their fireplaces going at this point. And she mentions it's 5.30 or 6 in the morning. It's pretty early. People aren't cooking breakfast yet. The businesses aren't up and running yet. Uh, people are not heating up water for washing at this point. That's why she said like the smoke was not hanging around their houses just yet. People aren't up and moving yet. And it also sounds like they got an unusually nice day that day. Um, it's not hazy. It's not raining. All of Dorothy's details help me buy into that line a little bit more. That's smokeless air. Also, William Wordsworth was one of the English romantic poets. Now that movement really prized nature, you know, meditating on the beauty of nature, the emotions that it brought up in you. They weren't really big on progressive movements, so I cannot imagine that the the romantics were very thrilled at the idea of industrialization. Uh, so that might be another reason why he said smokeless in there. There's some nostalgia about it. It's wistful. It's the city as he wishes it to be, as he wishes he could see it. Before we get back into the text, I mentioned that this was a sonnet. Specifically, it's a Petrarchan sonnet, which means that those 14 lines are divided into two sections. There's the first eight lines, the octave, and the last six lines, which is called a sestet. Now, if you look at the first eight lines and then the final six lines, you'll see there's kind of a change in tone there. Um, Wordsworth changes directions a little bit. In the first eight lines, you get a lot more details, physical details of what exactly he is seeing in front of him. And then in the last six lines, he kind of turns inward. You know, he remembers other things that he's seen and he is focused on the emotions that this site is bringing up in him. So the first eight lines are more outward focused. The final six lines are more inward focused. So that's the volta, the turn in direction, the change in purpose. Now let's go back to the beginning and take this line by line. First line. Earth has not anything to show more fair. So this is the most beautiful thing in the world. Uh, you could travel the entire globe. Nothing is going to compare to this. Nothing's going to beat this sight. Dull would he be of soul who could pass by a sight so touching in its majesty. So you would have nothing in your soul. You would have to have a heart of ice, a heart of stone to walk by this and not stop and take a breath, you know, not stop and be in awe of this, be overwhelmed by this sight. Line four, this city now doth like a garment wear the beauty of the morning. So the city wears the beauty of the morning like a piece of clothing, like a dress or a coat or something like this. And the sunrise, that beauty of the morning, that natural beauty is the city's only adornment. Um, you know, the people are not out and about, the horses are not out yet, the fires are not lit. We just have that natural beauty of sun. Silent, bare, ships, towers, domes, theaters, and temples lie open unto the fields and to the sky. So these are the physical details of what he's seeing. Uh, ships, that would be the merchant vessels down on the River Thames, 
towers. Um, if you look from Westminster Bridge now, you're going to see a, a very famous tower, Big Ben, but that would not have been one of the towers that he saw. Um, that one did not come along until later. Domes, that could be the dome over St. Paul's Cathedral. Theaters, uh, the historic West End, the very famous theater district of London. It has now um, expanded and includes the South Bank where the National Theater is, but he is looking towards the North Bank, so he might be seeing sites like the Royal Opera House. Temples, of course, that's West Westminster Abbey, the big Gothic cathedral, as well as St. Paul's Cathedral. He says that they're silent and bare, so these buildings have not come to life yet. Uh, there's no lights, there's no sound, uh, the workers on the docks are not present, the flags have not been raised over the ships, over the Houses of Parliament, so they are just clean, they're unadorned, open to the air. All bright and glittering in the smokeless air. Um, we already went through why that's not totally realistic. Um, it's rose colored glasses, but it is a beautiful, it is a beautiful idea. So we'll go with it. Line nine, never did sun more beautifully steep in his first splendor. So he's talking about the sunrise here, his first splendor when the sun first comes up, those, that first fresh lights. Um, more beautifully steep valley, rock, or hill. So even the sunshine, you know, the sunrise over a valley or a mountain, you know, a natural formation is not comparing to the sight of the sunrise over London. That's actually a big deal for Wordsworth. You know, those romantic poets love their, love their nature sights. Ne'er saw I never felt a calm so deep. I've never felt so at peace. I've never seen anything so calm. That first word, ne'er, it's never. He's cut out a syllable so that he can maintain iambic pentameter. Line 12. The river glideth at his own sweet will. Again, this is the River Thames that they are crossing. So he's saying, you know, it's very calm today. There's no wind. It's calm. It's quiet. The water is looking great. Dear God, the very houses seem asleep. So he's so moved by this that he is moved to pray. That is uh, the level of emotion that Wordsworth is at right now. The very houses seem asleep and all that mighty heart is lying still. So not only are the people not out and about yet, even the buildings seem asleep. That beating heart of the city, you know, the rhythm, the noise, uh, the, all the lights and sounds that are associated with it, that has not begun yet. You know, they've got this last breath of calm when the sun is coming up, but people have not opened their eyes and gotten moving yet. All right, that's about all I've got on Composed Upon Westminster Bridge. I hope something in there was helpful to you. If it was, please like and subscribe and turn on notifications so you know when the next story or poem becomes available. Again, this poem was by request and the city of London is very close to my heart, so I really enjoyed doing this and thank you to the person who suggested it. If you had a different story or poem in mind or a particular author that you're interested in, definitely drop that in the comments and I will see what I can do. Best of luck to you and I'll see you in the next chapter.